In today's video, we're going to go over another exciting video and the exciting topic of the photoelectric effect. In today's video, we are going to use the photoelectric effect to derive Planck's constant. Before we get started, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel, get all my excellent physics, chemistry, and math videos. And don't forget, I made several other videos over the photoelectric effect, uh, which you can link to in the upper right hand corner of this video. But let's get started here. This is Planck's constant and the photoelectric effect. And the problem here says that to produce photoelectrons, Light of different wavelengths is shined onto a photocell. For each wavelength of the incident light, the stopping potential U is measured and is given in the table below. So you can see here we have one, two, three, four, five different wavelengths. The wavelengths are increasing as we go from left to right. And then this is the stopping potential that was measured to uh, find the potential that is needed to stop those photoelectrons from reaching our anode. And you can see we have the following five stopping potentials. And you will notice that as we go across, the wavelength increases. But as we go across this way, the stopping potential decreases. And that's because as the wavelength increases, the energy of the incident photons is decreasing. So therefore, we're going to have a lower stopping potential. Now, what we want to do in this video is we want to make a graph of the data showing the relationship between the maximum kinetic energy of our photoelectrons, which we'll put on the y-axis, and the frequency of the incident light, which we're going to put on the x-axis. Then we're going to use that data to determine Planck's constant. We already know what Planck's constant is, but we're going to confirm Planck's constant. It's a very interesting part of the photoelectric effect. And then we're going to determine the cutoff frequency and the work function of the photocell based on the data that we have collected up here. So you know, uh, as we said, that we want to graph the frequency and the kinetic energy, the maximum kinetic energy of those photoelectrons. We were not given the frequency or the kinetic energy. We were given the wavelength of the incident photon, the incident light and we were given the stopping potential. So we need to convert these wavelengths in nanometers into frequency, and we need to convert the stopping potential into kinetic energy in electron volts of our photoelectrons. Now we're gonna do the frequency first, and this is 403 nanometers. Now this should be pretty straightforward. We're just gonna take our wavelength in nanometers. We're gonna convert from nanometers into meters by dividing by one times 10 to the ninth, because in one meter there are a billion nanometers. And that gives us our wavelength in meters of 4.03 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. We need meters because we're going to use these two equations or this equation to come up with the frequency. This says the C, the speed of light, is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. The wavelength must be in meters. Because our speed of light, 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, is in meters, so we rearrange the equation for the frequency, and we get C divided by the wavelength. And then we can simply convert to the frequency by taking the speed of light, which is basically the same all the time. It's the constant, 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, dividing by our wavelength in meters. And we get that the frequency for 403 nanometers is 7.44 times 10 to the 14 hertz. I'm going to put that right there on our table. Now, I'm going to do that four more times. I don't think I need to show the whole thing, go through each one. Just take the nanometers, divide by a billion, you get the whatever the uh, wavelength is, 4.03. This would be 4.46 4, 4 times 10 to the minus 7. Take the wavelength, insert it into this equation, and divide and get your frequency. And you should get the following four other frequencies. It's good to practice to see how that does, how that works out. So now we have our frequencies from our corresponding wavelengths or our corresponding wavelengths from our, frequent, from our, our corresponding frequencies from our wavelengths of light in nanometers, okay? So that's one part. Now, we also need to have the kinetic energy of those electrons based on the stopping potential, the kinetic energy in electron volts, because we're going to graph that kinetic energy in electron volts. We're going to do that on the next slide. Now, you should remember, when we shine light on the plate, that light, if it has enough energy to overcome the work function, which we have in all these cases because we have a stopping potential, then photoelectrons will be released, emitted from that plate. This is the cathode where the photoelectrons are going to come from. This is the anode where the photoelectrons are going to go to, and they are going to go across from one plate to the other. Now, what we do to measure the stopping potential, remember, is we set those plates, we attach them to a potential difference, so we have a negatively charged plate on one side and a positively charged plate on the other side. And we set the potential, the stopping potential, so it's just high enough, so the potential is just high enough between those two plates. So when that electron, those photoelectrons, move across from one plate to the other, 
they come right up to the anode, the collecting plate, but they don't actually get absorbed by that plate. And if we know that potential difference, then we know what the, uh, po the stopping potential is, or that is the stopping potential that is needed to get those electrons to stop right before they get to the anode. Now, I explained that in a previous video where I explained what the po stopping potential is. All right, now that means that when those electrons move across, they have some kinetic energy when they come off here. When they move across here, they're going to be slowing down, and just here they're going to stop, and that means all their kinetic energy has been converted into potential energy. Where did the energy go when they slow down? It goes into potential energy, the potential between those two plates, okay? Now that means that the kinetic energy here is equal to the potential energy here, and that means when we calculate the work that the, ener the potential energy is equal to the amount of work that the electric field did to stop those electrons. They had to apply a force over a distance, so they did some work. And we can calculate the amount of work done as the charge on the particle times the potential through, it, through which it moved. And that means that the kinetic energy is equal to E because E is the symbol we give for the charge on electron, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. It's basically Q, but it's a special kind of Q. It's E because it's the elementary charge times the potential through which they move. That means when those electrons move through this much potential, that they're going to have a kinetic energy of 1.8 electron volts for the first case. Now, these electrons move through this potential. They have a lower potential because this light has less energy. So that means their kinetic energy is going to be 1.5 electron volts, in this case 0 0.9, 0 0.075, and point, uh, 0 0.75, and 0 0.40 electron volts. All right, so that means now we have the frequency which we're going to graph, and we have the kinetic energy which we're going to graph, the maximum kinetic energy of those electrons, and then we can produce that graph which we're going to do right now on the next slide. So here is our graph. We have the frequency on the x-axis. We have the maximum kinetic energy on the y-axis. And here's the data points. I didn't include the wavelengths and the stopping potential, but we're going to graph the frequency and the kinetic energy. And we have five data points. The first data point is 1.8 electron volts. Now, this is 0, 1, 2, 3. So 1.8 is going to be somewhere around here. This is 7.44. So we're going to graph this somewhere a little less than 7.5 because this is 5, 6, 7. And that means that should end up right about there. The next data point is 1.50, which this is 1 and this is 2. So this is 1.5 right here in the middle. And this is 6.72 times 10 to the 14th which is like six and three quarters, so it should be somewhere right maybe around here. And there's the next one. Now, we're going to graph all five. You want to do this very carefully because you should notice that when you do that very carefully, they all line up on a straight line because there is a linear relationship between the frequency of the light and the kinetic energy that those electrons are going to have. Because when you increase the frequency, you increase the energy. And after overcoming the work function, then those electrons, as you increase the frequency and increase the energy, will have more kinetic energy. More kinetic energy, more energy will be left over to give to those photoelectrons. Now, there's three interesting things One of the, about this line. One is the slope, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Another thing is that this line crosses this axis. This line crosses the x-axis right here at this point, and it crosses the y-axis right down here at this point, where this line crosses the x-axis, if you remember, that is the cutoff frequency. Below that frequency, there's no energy. Those, connect, those electrons don't have any kinetic energy because we're not going to be producing any photoelectrons. But above this frequency, which we call the cutoff frequency, there'll be some energy for those photoelectrons. So that right there is the cutoff frequency, and that right there is the work function. Now, you can read it off the graph. This is something a little more than 3 times 10 to 14 hertz. And this is something a little more than 1 and probably less than 2 and maybe less than 1 and a half. So somewhere between 1 and 1 and a half. <clears throat> we can read those values off of there. But <clears throat> excuse me, we can also calculate those values from the data that we got, which we're going to do right now. And before we calculate the work function and the cutoff frequency, the other interesting thing about this line is that this line the slope of that line is equal to Planck's constant. 
So that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to calculate Planck's constant from this line just by finding the slope of the line. It's not that hard. Y equals mx plus b. You remember, m is the slope, the symbol for the slope. The slope, by definition, is the rise or the run, the change in the y, which is the kinetic energy, the change in the x, which is the frequency. And that means that that is Planck's constant. h is the symbol we give for Planck's constant. That means it's going to be the change in the kinetic energy between two points and the change in the frequency between two points. And we can do that right now. I'm going to use this point. I like to use the points that are farthest apart. I think that gives you the best answer. This point and this point. We're going to find the change in the kinetic energy and divide that by the change in the frequency. Now, you'll remember that this is the cutoff frequency in electron volts. Okay? So one of the first things we need to do is divide by the change in the frequency. So here's our first frequency and here's our second frequency. Remember there, times 10 to the uh, 14 hertz. Now we need to put the kinetic energy in there, all right? And we want to have the change in the kinetic energy. We have to have, first we have to convert, because this is electron volts. These two values are electron volts. And we don't want electron volts. We want joules, because Planck's constant is typically given in joule seconds. So we're going to take the difference in the kinetic energy, okay, in electron volts, and we need to convert that into kinetic energy in joules, which we've done this many times, converting electron volts into joules. We know that one electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So I take the difference in these two, which is just 1.4, I believe, multiply by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, and then you can divide those two values, and you get that Planck's constant is 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules, which is actually what Planck's constant is because it's a constant. The interesting thing is, though, though, that the slope of that line is actually equal to Planck's constant. So you can confirm Planck's constant or you can derive Planck's constant by finding the slope of that line. Okay, now the next thing we're going to do is we are going to get the work function for the photocell. Okay, now we have our equation, our photoelectric effect equation, which says that the work function is equal to the energy in the light minus the kinetic energy of those photoelectrons. Now the work function is typically given electron volts. We have the kinetic energy in electron volts, but we have our energy in wavelengths nanometers, in wavelength in nanometers. That means that once again, we need to convert the energy into electron volts. So we're going to do that first, and then we're going to plug the values into this equation. We want to find what is the work function of that photocell. So I'm going to take the energy is equal to hc divided by the wavelength. Now h is Planck's constant, c is the speed of light in a vacuum, and the wavelength is the wavelength in meters. Now, I converted this. This is 403 times 10 to the ninth, or uh, excuse me, the minus 9. Now, I put 403 times 10 to the minus 7. As we did previously, I converted into meters. And then you just divide those two, and you get that the energy in joules is 4.94 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. That's the energy associated with this wavelength of light, of light in nanometers. Well, once again, we need to convert to electron volts. I'm going to take that value. I know that one electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules, and I get that the energy in this light, excuse me, the energy in this light in electron volts is 3.08 electron volts. I'm going to put that here. I have this value here for the kinetic energy, and that means that the work function of that photocell is 1.28 electron volts. Okay, this is the energy that comes in from the light, like the total amount of energy. This is what's left over after the work function. This is the energy that's given to the photoelectrons. Well, where's the extra energy? The extra energy is the work function. That's the energy that needed to be used to kick out an electron from that photocell. Now, that will work for any of those data points. Okay, you, I chose this one, but you can confirm it. We're going to do, just show you really quick. If we do the same thing with this one, with this data point, we have the wavelength is 6.11 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. You see, once again, I have Planck's constant, the speed of light. I get that the energy associated with this light 
is 3.25 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Convert that to electron volts. That means that this light brought into that photocell, those photons of a light had 2.03, 2.03 electron volts. Then we have the en kinetic energy that was left over. After overcoming the work function, you get the same work function. You should always get the same work function, basically the same work function. Okay, so that's how you get the work function for that photocell. Now, we have one last thing we want to do, I believe, and that is to get the cutoff frequency. Now, there's one thing you need to remember. Here's our equation again. We don't need to remember that because we have that work function equal to energy divided by minus the kinetic energy. When you, you are at the work function, which is, excuse me, when you're at the cutoff frequency, which is the lowest frequency below which there's no energy left over for the kinetic, uh, for the kinetic energy of those photoelectrons, that means the kinetic energy is zero. So we can set this value to zero. Okay, that means all the energy from the incoming light was used to overcome the work function, and we assume there's no energy left for the kinetic energy of the electrons. So that simplifies our equation so that the work function is equal to hf, and we want to know what frequency is it that will make this case true, or really this case true when there's no energy left for the electrons and they will have no kinetic energy. So we're going to solve for f, and I put f0 because that's the symbol for the cutoff frequency, the cutoff frequency is going to be equal to the work function divided by h, and that means that the cutoff frequency is equal to the work function is 1.28 electron volts. We calculated that earlier, but once again, now this is the problem. We have Planck's constant in joule seconds, and this is an energy also like joules, but this is an electron volts, and this is joules, so once again, we need to convert electron volts into joules. And then you will get that this number of electron volts is equal to this number of energy in joules. So I'm going to take the electron volts out, and I'm going to put in there the joules, and then you divide those two, and you get, of course, that the cutoff frequency is 3.10 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Now you'll remember we said from our graph a long time ago, that uh, the cutoff frequency looked like it was just above three, and that's just above three. And remember, we said the work function was somewhere between one and one and a half, and 1.28. That's pretty close, right between there. Okay, so there you go. We did all of that stuff. Okay, we did those conversions. We did the graph. We confirmed Planck's constant. We calculated the work function, and we calculated the cutoff frequency. That's a lot to do in one video, but you just go step by step. Remember, it's, to me, it always seems like it's just a lot of converting back and forth between electron volts, joules, hertz, all that kind of stuff. Keep all that straight. Okay, thanks for watching. Please don't forget to do all the following four things. Subscribe to my channel. Get all my excellent physics, chemistry, and math videos. Leave me a nice positive comment in the comment section below, please. Helps my videos. Helps my channel. And you can give me a thumbs up and share this video with all of your friends. Don't forget, show them just how much you care. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.